Hey everyone, this is Alex and Ben. Welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge. In my mind, if you get the same benefit at a fraction of the cost to build and a fraction of the cost to operate, that's the direction you ought to go. PERS stands for Public Employee Retirement System. I think it's just the nature of the treasurer's office is that it tends to put people to sleep. I look back, and this is one I think that distinguishes me, sort of a difference between uh, Republicans and Democrats, and it sort of keeps me as a Republican. I think the challenge with Republicans is they don't see aspirations, and the challenge with Democrats is they don't see priorities. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We are really excited to bring you Jeff Goodman today. And uh, Jeff is kind of a a friend of ours as well. He frequently writes for the Oregon Way, uh, which I assume that many of you probably read. And if you don't, you should definitely go and check it out. If you just Google Oregon Way, uh, you're sure to find it. But uh, yeah, Jeff is a a really well-known figure in Oregon Republican politics. He ran for uh, state treasurer twice under the Republican Party, and he was the nominee in 2016 and 2020. Uh, he also served two terms on the Lake Oswego City Council, and uh, he's definitely been an advisor to a number of uh, different candidates from across the state and things like that. And on today's episode, we get really nerdy and really wonky on PERS, uh, which is surprisingly an issue that we haven't really talked about uh, that much yet, considering how much of an impact that it has on the state. Uh, we also talk a little bit about the breaking news that Oregon GOP Chairman Dallas Hurd has recently resigned. Uh, so you'll be able to hear Jeff's reaction and Jeff's take on that. Uh, and then we also ask him what it means to be a full-time investor, uh, because that's what he lists his occupation as, and that's uh, what he does for a living. So uh, definitely an episode that you won't want to miss. Uh, also, check us out on YouTube. I got really crazy today, and I'm wearing a hat uh, instead of did my hair. So you know we're always trying to do... Uh, new and funky things on this podcast to stay exciting. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for listening. Again, go check us out on YouTube. Make sure to subscribe to us there. Uh, Make sure to give us five stars and then subscribe on any podcast platform that you do use. So we'll go ahead and dive right in. Enjoy the episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Oregon Bridge. Today, we are very excited to bring you Jeff Goodman. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, and I've also said I'm better for seeing both of you. Yeah. Well, some people I would say it's probably it's it's worse for wear. <laughs> uh, so we're glad that you're in that that specific camp. Uh, now, Jeff, we have a bunch of different policy questions, different questions about your background and things like that. But the first thing that I have to ask you, uh, and I will say, I sort of let Jimmy Crumpacker off the hook here. When he was on our show. Uh, yes. Your biography notes you as a full-time investor. Uh, I've got to ask, what does it actually mean to be a full-time investor? Like as a job, what does that look like on a day-to-day basis? That's a great question. Uh, thank you. And I don't want to, I'm, I'm saying that, I'm reluctant to say that because I hear so many other people say that's a great question when they don't want to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I'll, I'll answer the question. My typical day is I spend a lot of time uh, reading uh, different uh, investment articles, uh, history, biography, uh, economics, uh, sociology, the whole spectrum of it, just trying to figure out the way the world is working or not working. Uh, and then translating that down into getting very specific, I spend a lot of time reading uh, financial reports, the uh, companies put out their annual reports or the quarterly reports they put out just to see what how they are doing and whether or not it fits it within the sort of things I'm thinking about with respect to the way the world is moving. That's interesting. I'm gonna, Alex, I'm going to ask go the ahead, I'm going to ask the follow up to that question, which is unrelated to uh, being a full time investor. But you're also a uh, it lists you as a former all American swimmer. And I will say when we've gotten coffee in the past, you are often wearing some uh, insignia with swimming on it. What is your connection to the uh, swimming community? Gosh, uh, that uh, we could spend the entire hour talking about that. <laughs> uh, it, it is, uh, it, it's a passion for me. Uh, I swam all the way through college. I had the opportunity to be part of a, a couple of All-American relays uh, with Division Three schools. Uh, stayed on after uh, finishing up my uh, grad school. Uh, when I came back to Oregon, got involved as a volunteer and have been a volunteer ever since. Um, I had the pleasure of serving 
uh, in three different four-year terms on the board of USA Swimming. Oh, wow. So, yeah, the most recently, oh gosh, about eight, 10 years ago. Uh, I, I look at the wall here, I can, <laughs> I got, yeah, about 10 years ago and uh, served as the uh, vice president admin, vice president uh, national admin. And then I know this will come as a, a complete shock to you. I also served four years as the treasurer. <laughs> You've been treasurer of like everything at this point. <laughs> it, it's, um, uh, well, a lot of organizations, you know, they're looking for somebody to fill that role. And uh, if I get involved, I'm, I'm happy to help if they, you know, if they don't have anybody else. <laughs> yeah, my, my mother-in-law is the, uh, she is now the resigned treasurer of this very small nonprofit organization. And she's uh, said it's the hardest and worst job she's ever had. So uh, kudos to you for having the financial skills to, to volunteer your time like that. So Jeff, you served two terms on the Lake Oswego City Council. Uh, yes. As I was saying, you know, a lot of our listeners are from the Portland area, but a lot of them are from all over the state. Uh, and we know that Lake Oswego is one of the most Problem plagued cities uh, in the area. You know, it's there's there's lots of economic development issues. Uh, clearly, my joke is falling a little bit flat because I have a serious face. But <laughs> I was like, uh, I wasn't actually sure where you were going with this. There, he's, like, like, he's, like, well, he's like, well, I'm actually curious to hear about these economic <laughs> development issues in Lake Oswego. Uh, but of course, LO, you know, the nicest, uh, arguably the nicest suburb. Someone's probably going to say that it's not because they have competing priorities. But uh, served two years as a city a city councilor there. Uh, eight years. Just eight years. Curious. Thank you. Uh, oh, two eight terms, years. right? Eight, eight years. years. Yeah, two yeah. terms, yes. Uh, what were the, kind of the different issues that, that you focused on there? We've had a lot of different uh, local elected officials on lately. We had the mayor of Tigard. We had the mayor of Beaverton. Uh, so we're always curious kind of about hearing, you know, about the local issues in terms of, uh, obviously, you served there for a while. What were kind of the different issues that you were focusing on? The... Uh, it's another, you know, good question. The issue that I was uh, most focused on was uh, over the entirety of the eight years was infrastructure, um, roads in particular, but all of the, oh, excuse me, all of the infrastructure uh, of the city in general. Uh, and I was also uh, one of the things I campaigned on when I did run for city council, uh, because it's not a, not a secret, was uh, I campaigned on opposition to the streetcar. Mm. That was planned to be built between Portland and uh, downtown Lake Oswego there on State Street. Uh, and this was one of, the most, one of those topics where, uh, I, astonishingly enough, I changed my mind on the issue. Because initially I was a supporter of the streetcar because we'd been advised that it won't cost the city anything to build it. And it won't cost the city anything to pay for the share of operations once it's built. And so my response to that, well, gosh, what's not to like? <laughs> What wasn't but, to like, Jeff? <laughs> yes, well, uh, uh, as conditions change, you know, you you think anew. And I started tracking things and looking at how things change. And all of a sudden, um, the city was going to have to put up money to help pay for its share of the capital cost. That is the cost of construction. And then uh, we were told that, oh, by the way, although we don't want you to have to pay for the operations, uh, you're going to have to pay for a percentage of the operations. And when I started asking questions on both those topics, how, where's the money gonna come from to build it? Where's the money gonna come from to pay for its operations? Uh, the best answer that I could get was, well, we've always worked that out before. <laughs> Not a good answer. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I ended up campaigning. And then the, another aspect of that was the, uh, I, I was looking at it and I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, one of the goals there is, uh, carbon reduction, which is an, uh, absolutely an admirable goal, and it needs to be achieved. And so I was looking at the on the capital costs, and I said, well, gosh, we could convert the uh, Willamette Shoreline, the uh, train line there between Lake Oswego and Portland, into a bike ped, while retaining the right to have it be a streetcar at some point in the future, and we would get the same targeted uh, carbon reduction for a fraction of the cost to build and a fraction of the cost to maintain. So I said, this, well, this, this becomes, I don't want to call it a no brainer, but in my mind, if you get the same benefit at a fraction of the cost to build and a fraction of the cost to operate, that's the direction you ought to go. And so I was campaigning on that and was fortunate enough to be elected back in uh, 2010. 
Uh, well, then after that, after 2010, you um, took a stab at statewide office um, on two separate occasions running for Oregon State Treasurer. I did. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into some of the policy issues. In fact, Titus has a, has a wonky one next. Well, um, good. But, but before we do that, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, I believe the most recent time you ran, was it 14 and 18 were the two years you ran? Uh, 16 and 20, but thank you for asking. 16 and 20. So both times you ran, Donald yes. Trump was on the ballot as a Republican. Yes. Um, and you were running as a Republican. So I'm, yes. I'm, I'm asking this question because I know you well enough to know that um, you have a very, I would describe you as a relatively independent thinker. I think you, you sort of are unconstrained by party orthodoxy, but you continue to be a member of the Republican Party. So I'm wondering if you can use your campaigns for state treasurer, um, you know, where Donald Trump is on the ballot. I'm sure there's a lot of questions during the, on the campaign trail about Donald Trump for an office, by the way, that is not nearly it's a partisan office, but it's not nearly as political as, say, the governor's office um, or state legislative office. What was the experience of running for statewide office as a Republican in the age of Donald Trump like for you? Well, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the experience of running, uh, getting all over the state. Uh, you know, I had weekends where I put a thousand miles on my car, so, which was great. But and meeting all sorts of people, and, and just as a as a side note, one of the people I met, uh, he lives over in Eastern Oregon. He was like the great 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 grandson of President John Adams. <laughs> and I, you know, how cool is that? Yeah. Uh, but the uh, the office of, of the treasurer, you know, as, as I was out talking with groups. Very rarely did the question of uh, Donald Trump the candidate in 16 or Donald Trump the president come up in 2020. Uh, I was focusing uh, on the treasurer's office. I was doing the same thing. If people would ask me about issues that were not related to the treasurer's office, I said, gosh, thank you for that question. You should talk to so-and-so who's running for the legislature or running for secretary of state or running for senator. If you want to talk about uh, the uh, impact of PERS and the trade-off it has on the various services that we want to provide. If you want to talk about the investments that the state, the state is making, um, if you want to talk about uh, what my belief is, is how you should approach, say, financing the interstate bridge and what the state's role should be a part of that, let's, you know, so to speak, get down and dirty and start working that. So the, the question really rarely came up. That's great. Well, you did a perfect segue for, for Alex. Yeah, I, I do have one question before that, too. Uh, and, and obviously, you, Please. I know that your, your first race, you came, uh, I think Tobias ended up with like 44.5%, and you had 41, almost 42%. Uh, and then yes. Chris Telford, if I'm not mistaken, got like 9% or something close in that race. Maybe my math adds up to more than 100 there, but yep. I think it's relatively close. You're in the ballpark. Uh, I'm in the ballpark. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what were some of the lessons that you learned, uh, you know, and obviously you'd run for local office before too, right? Mm -hmm. But then of course you stepped up majorly on the stage for statewide office. Uh, what is advice that you would give? Uh, I'm curious specifically on the Republican side of the aisle to uh, first time candidates who are running to statewide office. Like what would you kind of recommend them? Maybe, maybe if you made certain mistakes, you wouldn't want them to fall into or, or something like that. I'm curious of your thoughts. Oh, sure. Well, I've, I've been very, um, nonpartisan and free with my advice to any candidate, Republican, Democrat, independent, non-affiliated, uh, about what I think they should do or should not do uh, when they're running for office, be it locally or statewide. Uh, I'll come back to that in just a moment, uh, but thank you for bringing up the closeness of the race in 2016, uh, because I'm proud of that, because I came closer to winning statewide office uh, as, a, as a Republican than anybody other than in the last 30 years, than anybody other than Chris Dudley when he ran for governor a dozen years ago, um, and he spent close to $10 million, and Dennis Richardson, who did win for Secretary of State, uh, and Dennis, I think, spent about 4 or $5 million. I spent about a quarter million, and uh, so on a cost per vote, I was very effective with my dollars. <laughs> So, and then in 2020, when I ran again, uh, it was not as close. I got more votes than I did in 2016, uh, but it was not as close because, uh, well, one, I was running against an incumbent, uh, and two, the uh, atmosphere in 2020 was, 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 it was more partisan uh, than I could see, 
uh, than it was in 2016. Although again, I did not get a lot of questions um, about uh, either Donald Trump uh, or Joe Biden in 20 or Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in 2016. Uh, I think it's just the nature of the treasurer's office is that it tends to put people to sleep. <laughs> one, one, <laughs> one quick follow-up on politics um, that I am curious about before we go to policy. Did you ever have any, from 2016 to 2020, did you ever have any moments where you're like, maybe I don't want to be a member of the Republican Party anymore, or, or even maybe I don't want to be involved in politics anymore um, because of... Obviously, as you described, voting behavior definitely was more partisan, but I actually think, you know, social, cultural behavior became a lot more partisan and divisive um, in that period. So I'm wondering, were there ever moments where you're like, you know, I don't want to be a Republican or maybe I'm taking a break from politics or or maybe not? Well, I, I had the chance to take a break from politics, whether I wanted it or not. <laughs> right. Thank you, voters. We appreciate yes. that. Yeah. The, the, uh, after... Uh, after 2020, my comment was at a, at a oops, spotty. <laughs> this, if, this is why you got to watch the YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I sort of, I gave a speech uh, shortly after the election um, where I commented, I said, the voters of Oregon have spoken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, again, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed the running. Um, I look back and I say on, on the question of Republican versus Democrat, uh, you know, and I wrote a I had an article that I wrote uh, back in, it got published, I think, in December of 2020 or January 2021, where I talked about the Republican Party that I'm a part of, which I call it the Party of Lincoln. Uh, when you think about what, what, what happened under President Lincoln and the Republican Party, granted, 170 years ago, but you had the uh, economic opportunities with the Transcontinental Railroad, the educational opportunities with the land grant colleges, the recreational opportunities with the creation of uh, Yosemite uh, National Park, which is certainly a jewel in our national park system. Uh, obviously, you know, preserving the union and ultimately re re resulting in uh, freeing the slaves in uh, the South. Uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, uh, all about creating greater opportunity. You go forward on the present national scale with uh, President Theodore Roosevelt with his ethos of conservation. You come forward to President Eisenhower with the opportunity with the interstate highway system, with all the flaws that are there, but nonetheless, it has been a magnificent uh, accomplishment for the country. Uh, you even come more closer to home where you have President George H.W. Bush, uh, again, with the theme of expanding opportunity with the American with Disabilities Act, which I think in, as the years go by will come down to be viewed as, as one of the great you know, opportunity expanding acts. So that's the Republican Party that, that I follow on the national level. On a local level, you have people like Tom McCall, Norma Paulus, um, uh, Senator Atkinson with uh, environmental work here in Oregon. Uh, and focusing on saying, let's provide those services in a cost-effective manner that people want to have. Uh, let's try and do, and this is one I think that distinguishes me, sort of a difference between uh, Republicans and Democrats, and it sort of keeps me as a Republican. And this is, a, I acknowledge that this is a gross oversimplification. <laughs> okay. So let me put that out there right up front. I think the challenge with Republicans is they don't see aspirations. And the challenge with Democrats is they don't see priorities. And I say that mm. if everything's important, nothing's important. Um, and in terms of aspirations, it's, it's, it's looking to the past. Mm. Saying, you know, I, I, like the pa I like the way it was. Well, no, you gotta acknowledge their aspirations going forward. Yeah. Oversimplified, but there's enough truth into it that whenever I've said that to somebody, uh, I sort of get a knowing nod, a knowing mm -hmm. smile. Um, on occasion, they say, Jeff, you're absolutely right. <laughs> interesting. No, that is, uh, that is interesting. Uh, but so, does, does that answer your question? It does. Yes, okay. it does. Okay. And I think it will, it will give a flavor of the kind of thinker and Republican you are to our listeners, which is what I was hoping for. So thank you for that. Well, I'll add on a, a one more comment before we go on to the next questions, the next topics is, 
I've been using this, this phrase in the last few months is that just because I'm in favor of something doesn't mean I'm, I'm going to turn my brain off. <laughs> good. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, how, where, where else do you want to go with this? Yeah. So, so Jeff, we uh, want to transition to a topic that uh, you have spoken quite a bit about, written a bit about, uh, campaigned quite a bit on as well. And that topic is furs. Uh, but before we even get to the issue at hand, uh, I think, actually, I don't even know if this is true, but I think a, many Oregonians, they know what the word PERS is <coughs> broadly. But what actually is PERS? Like, what, what is the PERS system? Uh, give us kind of a brief overview and introduction to that. Sure. You bet. Well, we could have a course at PSU that would cover the entire uh, semester or quarter at PSU and still just start to scratch the surface of the complexity of it. Uh, but PERS stands for Public Employee Retirement System. And it is the system that we have in place so as to provide a good retirement for all people who choose to go into public service. That's at the state, county, city, school board, and all the other organizations. Because you want to have a strong, solid retirement system for the people who choose public service. That's what PERS is all about, is providing that retirement. Yeah. And so... Uh, well, then, Jeff, why do you want to cut people's retirement? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Take, taking us into bad direction. Uh, uh, okay. So, so, right. Okay. So, yeah. That, that's, like, that's like somebody asking a question. When did you stop beating your spouse? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> well, so, uh, oh, go ahead, Alex. Go ahead. Yeah. So, and of course, and here, here's kind of the thing about PERS, which is interesting to me, right? People on the right talk about this issue all the time, that PERS is continuing to grow. Uh, it's unsustainable. You know, uh, I think Alan Alley did like a whole podcast series on this or something. And like, I remember when he was running for governor and he went up on the stage at Dorchester and he had this like giant PERS chart, which I'm sure that one, I couldn't actually even see what was on the chart because I was too far away <laughs> in the audience. But two, I was like- That was the whole people. idea. Uh, probably 10 people in this room can even understand what's going on right now. Uh, and I was not one of them. But uh, of course, <laughs> people on the right, PERS is a problem. It's it's accelerating too much, basically. Uh, but then I think, too, people on the left, I mean, also, I think, recognizes that the current trajectory that it's on is not sustainable uh, in terms of being able to, you know, properly fund state employee retirements and things like that. Uh, what like What is the main problem in your mind of PERS? And basically, what caused us to get to where we are today on the issue. You bet. Uh, what, what caused us, let me do the, the latter part, the later question first. What caused us for the challenge that we have, and I don't want to call it a problem, it's a challenge that we have, our decisions made many, many years ago uh, with respect to the amount of retirement that, and the kind of benefit that somebody would get if they worked uh, as a part of the PERS system. If you want to, so that's number one, and it will take many years for us to work it out. Number two, the PERS system is in no danger of going under. If you are a part of the system and you have certain benefits that are going to come to you, they are going to come to you, period. Explanation mm -hmm. point. Uh, two explanation points on top of that. Number Which three, is really important because that is not the way it is always described or understood by political actors. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I mean, PERS is an, an enormously complex system. Uh, it's either the first or the second most complex retirement system in the country. But there are ways to look at it that are pretty straightforward that uh, any person in the street can sort of follow. And here's a couple examples of that. Actually, sorry, Jeff, before you go into that, can oh. we just go back to something you just said? You said that it's one of the most complex retirement yes. systems in the country. Uh, why, why, like, is Oregon's just much more complex than other states? And then if so, yeah. like, wh why, why is that the way that it is? That's really interesting. You bet. Uh, we have three different kinds of retirements, and it's called going a little in the weeds. Uh, so I apologize to you and uh, all of your listeners. You we have to get nerdy. Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> you, oh, you, okay. you can well, talk good. nerdy to us. Okay. Well, then <laughs> I will talk nerdy to you. Okay. Um, you have what is called tier one, tier two, and I refer to it as tier three. And that is when, based upon the time of when you went into public service. Now, all employees, all people who are joining and go to work for the state, the county, the city, school districts, et cetera, today 
are a part of tier three. When you were initially in tier one, those who went in many years ago, that was a defined benefit program. Now, those are some wonky words. What's that mean? It means that the benefit that you're going to get is clearly defined. You know exactly what you're going to get. It doesn't matter where the money's coming. You don't care where the money's coming from. If when you signed up and it said, when I if I retire in 30 years, I am going to collect X dollars, you will collect X dollars, period. You don't have to put anything into it. It's just simply a part of your compensation for where you're working. Then you have tier two, which is more a blended system where you have a defined benefit. This is exactly what you're getting. You don't have to put anything for it. And then you have defined contribution, which is you put in some money. So tier two was a blended program. And then you have the tier three where it is a defined contribution program. So you have employees in the system from all three different levels. And you have then all sorts of the complexities of what's your marital status, uh, when did you retire? When did your spouse retire? And all sorts of disability, all that gets wrapped in to make it more and more complex. Hmm. So, okay. So I'll, I'll thank you for that explanation, um, Jeff. I think that's super clear. So I think what Alex is referring to when he talks about long-term sustainability, isn't the sustainability of PERS. It's the unfunded actuarial liability, which mm -hmm tends to vacillate based on stock market returns, the way the money is invested, et cetera. Why should people care about high, how high the UAL or unfunded actuarial liability is? Why does that number matter? You bet. Uh, it's, it's a good question and I'll try and keep it on a high level simplified and then you guys can ask me questions sure. to drill down. Sure. Okay. The number one, uh, you have the two sides in, the, in our government for this. You have the investment side, the assets, which the Oregon Investment Council oversees through the, and the treasurer's office runs it. And then you have the benefit side, which comes through the PERS board. That's the side where you're determining, where it's been determined as to what you're paying out and et cetera. Each with a different responsibility, there's an overlap, but each has their own areas of responsibility. Within that framework of the unfunded liability, uh, and the, the obligations that you have, I want to emphasize the uh, Treasury, Oregon's Treasury on the investment side, they're operating on all eight cylinders. Or I don't know what the comparable phrase will be for an electric car. <laughs> I mean, uh, either. Yeah. A lot of volts or something. I don't know. A lot of volts. Yeah. But whatever it is for comparable and operating on all eight cylinders or all 10 cylinders, the investment side on Oregon, they are doing remarkably well. And we've just had some great investment returns over the last decade. And they're, they're very much on, on top of it. Oh, excuse me. As a result of the great investment returns over the last decade, uh, the unfunded liability, what is called the UAL, unfunded actuarial liability. Um, as a side note, you know what the purpose of, of, of actuaries is? Or actuaries are? Isn't it to, to make accountants look exciting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> But when you look at it, the actuarial, that unfunded actual li actuarial liability has actually come down in this last year, which as a, if you look at it as a relative proportion of the total assets, we've made progress. Not only did it come down in absolute terms, but it came down in terms of as a percentage of what the total assets that we have to invest. This is all good. The challenge comes that over the last decade, we have seen that contribution rate. Now, I'm going a little wonky again. The contribution rate is if, you, if your pay is $100 a month and you're working, say, for the city or a system wide, let's go, we have my city system wide. If your pay is $100 a month, the city or whoever you're working for is contributing about $25 into the per system. That's the contribution side. It used to be a decade ago, that number was half that. So think about mm. it. You've had great investment returns over the decade, but the amount and the amount that's being contributed has doubled. The actuarial liability has come down and is designed to go to zero over the next 20 years based on all sorts of assumptions. But when you've had to contribute more to the retirement system, those are dollars that are not available to pay for parks, to pay for more school teachers, to pay for more police officers, 
to pay for more fire, to pay for planning and all these other services. So that's the trade-off that you have. And that's a constant discussion. And that's where it gets down very quickly into nuance, where it's really important that you have uh, people in the legislature uh, and people in the executive branch, uh, who, as I call it, they speak number. Because it's not an easy issue and it's a nuanced issue, but it's very much about the question of trade-offs. Because if you do this, then you're not doing that. And and to that to that point uh, of nuance, you you've also got the challenge of Supreme Court decisions who put some pretty severe limitations on what can be done retrospectively to those tier one employees you described who have uh, the most generous of the retirement plans. So in effect, what where most of the financial savings can be done are prospectively, but the people who are in tier three or OPSERP are actually the ones who are receiving a far less generous benefit than the tier one folks. And so you also want to make sure what like one of my priorities, for example, is we're we have pretty severe workforce challenges for public employees right now, including educators. Yep. Um, so part well, of the so challenge is private workforce. Right. Yeah, workforce uh-huh. challenges all around. Um, but part of the challenge is historically, like for people like my mom, the retirement benefit was part of the attraction um, to pursuing a public service job. So yes. when you're talking about trade-offs. It's more than, you know, it's, I think that's the challenge. People think the trade-off is like, well, we either cut PERS or we keep PERS. And it's like, well, no, within PERS, you've got three tiers of employees. You've got, um, you know, different retirement dates. You've got the uh, amortization, which would take another three podcasts to explain, um, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I appreciate the way that you approach it in, with, with uh, a, um, an acknowledgement of the nuance uh, like for example, you you we were just talking before we started recording about the op-ed that you shared, and I think there were five solutions, mm-hmm. and I think only one of those solutions um, you called for potentially employees paying more, uh, mm-hmm. and four of them were actually more I would describe the government actions in terms of government investing money in different way, et cetera, et cetera. So before we move on from this, any final word that you wanted to share? on PERS or maybe a, a high line um, from that op-ed? You bet. Uh, I'll offer two thoughts. Uh, number one, a way of somebody who wants to think about PERS broadly, yes, it's okay, buddy, <laughs> um, uh, is there's a real simple formula. It's called C, e, I'm sorry, B equals C plus C. B is benefits, C is contributions, E is earnings. So benefits, equals contributions plus earnings. The benefits are negotiated. The contributions are determined by a calculation. The earnings are what we have from the investments that the state makes on behalf of all of the people in the system. And if earnings go down and B doesn't change, C has to go up because B has to equal C plus C. Uh, and if, if for a person who just wants to sort of get a general understanding of what the whole system is about, starting with that formula is a great place just to think about it. Thanks for bringing up my re- recent uh, op-ed piece um, that got published uh, in the uh, Portland Tribune. Uh, and you're right, I identified five possibilities that the legislature could choose to act on, only one of which was asking employees to put up more. It was uh, disappointing to me that in the recent short legislative session with the state awash in money, that they didn't take some of that money and put it into some additional contributions into the PERS system, dedicating say $100 million a year for each of the next 10 years. Now, there's a downside to that we've talked about, that's the trade-off. If you put 100 million a year into PERS uh, from that for the next 10 years, that's money that couldn't be spent elsewhere. On the other hand, that if we don't get the investment returns going forward, I'm going to be really glad that we've put that money in. And that's my great concern. This was a, cha- a, a one time, uh, perhaps in a decade or longer, to do something uh, to sh- help shore up the system without having to take it out of people's uh, pay. Mm-hmm. And the legislature uh, and the governor uh, chose not to do anything. And well, you, know, you make the argument and see what happens. But I, I, I admit I was disappointed that they chose not to. So if you want to learn more on this, um, Jeff's op-ed piece is a good good place to start. Um, so I got another another uh, treasury question for you. 
and then we'll, we'll move on um, to some other other issues. So, wait, wait, wait a minute. There are issues beside treasure. <laughs> yeah, yes, I know. You you spend mo- almost all of your time just you can't take your treasure hat off. <laughs> um, but we're going to ask you to in a moment. But before we do, um, divestment has been sure. a really hot topic. Um, and bef- even before um, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There was conversations about divesting because of fossil fuels. Um, Alex has been talking about divesting in Chinese companies for a long time. Um, And then, of course, Vladimir Putin uh, invades Ukraine in in a disgusting expansionist war. And all of a sudden, um, there's pressure put on by a lot of different people. I I, I think what's interesting about this is it seems pretty cross-partisan, the level of support that's sort of against Putin and his actions. But one of the ways that's manifested itself is Tobias Reed did actually divest. Um, it's a very, very small amount relative to the entire amount of assets we have. I think it's like a hundred and something million um, that were that were somehow involved in either Russian companies or invested with the Russian government in some way. And I believe that money has all been divested. Um, or in the process of being done. Sure. Yeah, yeah right, right. So my question for you is, as someone who I think uh, I describe as a sort of technical expert on this side of things. Mm. A little bit. Should should divestment be used as a tool to achieve political aims? Like if you are against fossil fuels um, and you think we need to much more rapidly move towards carbon neutrality, should investment or divestment of state resources reflect that? Or do you think it should be exclusively about return on investments? And if, or is there somewhere in between that you see um, a middle ground? Uh, Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Tell me more. Uh, Tell me more, okay. Uh, Well, number one, let's use on the, the question on the decarbonization, okay? There is no question that that has to occur. And that's, should not be a point of, of debate. We need to decarbonize. Uh, it's going to take time. It's going to be expensive, but it has to be done. At the same time, oil and gas is not going to go away. Uh, it is too integrated into too much of what we have in, in our economy. So you've got two, I don't want to call them conflicting, but two goals which at time can be working as cross purposes. Secondly, with request, you made a good point, uh, on, you know, should the only goal be maximization of the return with the appropriate risk that you're taking. I'll put an example back for you. Uh, I had uh, one of my aunts, and I had a lot of aunts and uncles. My mother was the baby of nine. My dad was the baby of six. So uh, lots of cousins, lots of aunts and uncles. That, that generation is all gone now. Uh, but I had one of my aunts who passed away from lung cancer. Uh, she was a, a chain smoker of camels unfiltered for like 40 years mm. and then quit cold turkey wow. uh, and lived to 91. Go figure. <laughs> uh, but I mean, lung cancer is, is, is a terrible, is a terrible death. Uh, and yet tobacco is legal. Would I advocate divesting of all tobacco stocks because of my dislike of, of what it does for people who smoke? You know, it's a legal drug. The other part, again, getting technical or getting getting down to sort of in, into the weeds, uh, take a company, say, for example, uh, British Petroleum. You know, they have significant in the measured in the billions of dollars of investments in renewables. Hmm. So should we have a policy that says we're going to divest British Petroleum or not invest to it in the first place because they happen to have some portion of what they do in oil and gas? even though they have a big chunk. And then it leads you down to the next question. Well, should it be if they have 60% in renewables and 40% in oil and gas, that's okay? Well, if the answer is yes, well then why not 59, 41? And going down on that. So it is a constant balancing act between trying to move the direction you want to. um, And as a general statement, I am reluctant to go down the divestment route uh, let me put it, qualify this as a treasurer with my treasurer's hat on, mm. I would be reluctant to go down the divestment road because of just some of the issues that I've talked about here. At the same time, 
putting my bigger hat on of being a resident of the state of Oregon, a resident of the country, you know, a resident of this world, do we need to decarbonize? Absolutely. Which also means that I think over just the course of how the capitalistic system works, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to invest in renewables and make a lot of money to provide for the retirement in our PERS and be probably fewer opportunities going forward to make money in say oil and gas. So the, the, you wanna maximize the free flow of capital. And as we decarbonize, that means there's gonna be less money going into oil and gas. I don't see at least in my lifetime or your lifetimes that we're ever gonna to go to zero usage of oil and gas. So we have to address the question of how do we deal with that and go off. But uh, that's a long way of saying, you know, I'm not sure that just simply saying divest is an effective means of providing the way we want to go forward, even though I acknowledge the direction that we have to go. Quick follow-up, and then Alex, um, I'll hand Please. to you. On the Russia-specific question, granted yes. it was a relatively small amount of money, but would you agree that that was the correct policy choice? We Yes, Oregon is following the federal uh, federal rules, so we really didn't have much choice in the matter. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought that was yeah. a state prerogative. Well, it, it's you know, it's it's like a lot of things. You don't hear the secondary or tertiary story behind things. Sure. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good to know, Alex. Fair enough. Uh, okay, Jeff. So we do have a relatively breaking news question to ask you. Now, it's not uh, too much breaking news because it will basically when this podcast comes out, it will have been about a week, but still relatively recent. So. Uh, as I'm sure that you probably had seen, uh, Senator Dallas Hurd has resigned as the Oregon Republican Party chair. Uh, and if you had a chance to uh, read his resignation letter, there's some uh, pretty pretty big claims basically made in that. Uh, I don't have it up right in front of me, but I believe he uh, noted that members of the party were using communist tactics against him. Uh, and there was some other things uh, in there, but he has effectively resigned, yeah, as of March 11. So he's no longer the chair. There's now an acting chair. Uh, curious of, you know, obviously you ran as the GOP nominee statewide twice, and I looked at your list of endorsements. You had endorsements from folks who I would consider to be barely Republicans, very moderate, and then folks like Sam Carpenter, who I consider to be very, very conservative. Uh, initial reaction to Dallas Hurd's resignation and sort of what's your general thoughts on kind of the state of the party after hearing that? You bet. Uh, I also had endorsements from any number of people who might consider themselves independents, non-affiliated, or Democrats. Because uh, so I just want to give the complete picture. I mean, I, granted, I had more Republican endorsements, but I, it, it covered the whole spectrum. Totally. So uh, I've operated for a, a, a long time, and this was a lesson from my parents and my, my dad in particular, uh, is that uh, you know, assume the best in the other person until shown otherwise. Um, I suspect that the uh, the challenge of the recent legislative session where from legislators I know, I mean, they put their heart and soul and their time and they get pretty tired pretty quickly. And come on, Spotty. <laughs> Sorry. I hope you can edit that out. Uh, <laughs> I think that actually makes it even Yeah, better. that's the stuff we like to leave in. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Um, so I suspect, you know, he, he may have spoken in a, in a moment where he was tired uh, or maybe just had a particularly difficult day uh, and o overstated. Uh, I mean, I know he's, you know, think about he's being pulled not only politically in all the directions where he's a, a senator in our, our state legislature. He was the chair of the Oregon Republican Party. Uh, he has a, a young family. He has his business outside of that. Uh, mm -hmm. So it could just simply be, you know, the pressure got to him and so it, it got let off in a manner that he probably you know if he, as he looks back sort of thinks maybe i wouldn't have done it this way um so yeah i, I mean I, yeah and it, well for me though and i actually thought i mean uh i had too much picture of behind the scenes but like forwardly i thought dallas is actually doing a great job like the social media accounts are now professional uh, like we seem to be actually recruiting candidates across the state. And I know that was part of his big initiative that he had talked about when he came on to our podcast. I guess I'm asking less about sort of what he had said in his letter, but uh, you know, Dallas is a, a very conservative guy, uh, very revered amongst conservative grassroots and things like that. Uh, and obviously you ran twice for statewide office, having had support from the official 
Republican apparatus, which is the Oregon Republican Party. Uh, I'm just sort of curious of like what you think this says about uh, the state of that vehicle, right? Like so close to the election too. I mean, we're what, less than basically eight months out from election day and the chairman of the Oregon Republican Party has just resigned. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the, there's the, uh, the resignation and then there's the manner of the resignation. Uh, the, the resignation itself was, okay, these things happen. Uh, the manner of it, as we've, we've talked about, um, uh, I think you know, I don't read a lot much into it because, I mean, I've had the opportunity and, and indeed the pleasure uh, of attending various Democratic Party events. Uh, I, see you there, I see you there pretty frequently. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. But, but it's been, you know, Multnomah County events um, or, or the statewide uh, events. And you know, I, I, I'm always very, I do my best to be very respectful, uh, but, you know, because there's generally, you know, some really good speakers, uh, and I like hearing from, you know, good speakers with what they have to say, but I also know from when I've been at those events and sitting around the table, uh, or in conversation before and after, uh, you can you know, have a lot of what you might call, how should we say, um, high emotion statements that are made. Um, and you just, that's just go, I think it just sort of goes with the territory. Um, you know, I, I'm just, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't know what kind of, you know, life he's leading other than I know he's busy. Um, and, you know, as my, as my late father used to say to me, you know, if, if Jeff, if both of us agree on everything, one of us is unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> I, li I like that. Yeah. So, feel so free to use it. <laughs> so um, in our final little portion here, it looks like we've got a few minutes left is, uh, you know, the way I describe 2022 is a potentially transformational moment for Oregon's, Oregon and Oregon politics in particular. We will have a new governor, um, a relatively new speaker, um, a new Senate president, potentially new set, new majority leaders or relatively new majority leaders on both sides. Uh, we'll have massive turnover in the state legislature. And so, and uh, Republicans haven't won the governor's office since the 80s. And this is, by some people's estimations, their best chance um, in many, many years. Mm -hmm. So I guess my first question, uh, and this is the easier one. I would, uh, agree, I would agree with that assessment on a general high level basis. Okay, good. So my first question is, and granted, we should also mention, it's worth noting, there are uh, there will be likely three major candidates for governor instead of just a Democrat and Republican. Sen former Senator Betsy Johnson will almost certainly have the resources and the ballot access to be a contender. So my first question is, have you endorsed or are you supporting uh, any of the candidates for governor so far? No, okay. not so far. And do you think uh, you might? Do you think you might uh, before the election? Probably not, but then again, nobody's asked. <laughs> yeah, all right, if you're a listener, give Jeff a call. <laughs> wait, really, yeah. nobody's but, asked you yet? Not on, on the governor's side? Uh, oh, wait a minute, no. Um, yeah, nobody on the governor. I've had, I've had offers to, I've had asks to help in campaigns, uh, which I have, I've declined, uh, but nobody's asked for an official endorsement uh, and the governor's race, but stepping aside from the governor's race, because uh, certainly, whether on the on the on the D side, you've got two experienced candidates between Tobias and Tina. Mm -hmm. So you know, different, very different people, but you know they're experienced. And certainly, there's lots of things you can say about former Senator uh, Johnson, uh, Betsy, but no one can't say that she isn't experienced. True, uh, and that she isn't capable of doing the job, and then depending on who the R's end up nominating, you know, we'll just have to wait and see on that. What's of more concern to me is, uh, as you alluded to, there's an incredible amount of turnover in the legislature, and you can attribute whatever reasons you want to to that. Uh, I'm just worried about the day-to-day -day basics of gov running our government. Uh, with so many new faces, as I call them, they're going to be down there trying to figure out, I, I describe this, where's the bathroom? <laughs> well, okay. I think, I think, uh, that worries me. 
we may I'm worried about that too as someone who's running for the legislature um I just I was looking at some of the committee memberships and for example in the House Healthcare Committee which healthcare policy love it or hate it is very complex in this country and in this state because of all the various programs you've got federal rules state rules um employer plans you've got a an ACA marketplace you've got subsidies you've got et cetera. Et cetera. Nine out of the 10 current members of the House Health Care Committee are not running for re-election. And the one that is running for re-election is a freshman legislator. Yes. Um, that's a challenge. Um, for example, if you were if you were crafting a board of directors for a large nonprofit, you would want continuity um, on that board to have institutional memory, different types of expertise, et cetera. And I worry that the high level of turnover um, could be challenging. Now on the on the flip we're, side, we're on the same page, and you know, I think, frankly, I think it, will, it will be challenging. Not could be, it will be. Very fair, and I, and so we could get into solutions there. I think professionalizing the legislature, legislative pay, you know, our potentials. I think there's more to it than that, frankly. Um, but what I want to shift to really uh, kind of abruptly here is. There also is opportunity um, embedded in change. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, you recently wrote a piece in the Oregon Way um, where, yes, you did, where you um, you cited like a dozen or so, um, uh, I don't want to use the term failure, although some of these would qualify as failures. Some of them might have been mistakes or oversights or whatever. But I every used the word debacle in a couple of them. <laughs> yeah. So the debacle ones you used were um, getting out renter assistance and landlord assistance. Um, then there were other things like signing up for the COVID vaccine through a state website, uh, the employment division getting out unemployment benefits. Um, you know, there's CR the the CRC, the Columbia River Crossing. The fact that the new family leave program um, isn't seems like it is not going to be up and running at the timeline that was set in legislative mandate. Yes. Given the fluid dynamic of the people who will be in these positions of power in the legislature and in the executive branch, and what I think. I believe, even as a Democrat, we should all be able to acknowledge our um, unacceptable levels of government not providing services that it needs to. Mm -hmm. What? How do we? How do we moving forward? Starting in twenty twenty three, January twenty twenty three, where all these new people are going to come in. What is your advice or recommendations to mitigate these kinds of? I mean, because when we're talking about these policy issues, they're big, they're complex, they're massive, they're hundreds of millions or more dollars, they're reaching hundreds of thousands of people in some cases. So moving forward, what needs to be done in this state to prevent those sorts of things from happening? Um, and you have 30 seconds, uh, ready, set, go. I'm kidding. <laughs> but it's a huge, it's a huge question. I'm curious of how, how you think about it. Uh, well, I thought about it a lot. Uh, and I hope it showed in, in the piece that I wrote. Uh, number one, I think, is going in there with a certain degree of humility uh, and understanding that uh, just because you are now sitting in Salem doesn't mean you know what you're talking about. Uh, it means you, you got elected, but you may not have any clue as to the uh, operations of things. Uh, number two is trying to find out, not trying to find, understanding what are the questions to ask. Hmm. For example, let's talk about a uh, let's let's use the um, employment division computer upgrade where they had the money 10 years ago, 11 years ago from the federal government, and it hasn't happened. Well, somebody in the legislature, somebody in the executive branch or some buddies in both of those groups, the executive and the legislative, should have been asking two basic questions on a regular basis. Number one, what percent of the product project is done? And then number two, what percent of the money has been spent? Now, if 10% of the project is done and 5% of the money has been spent, you say, hey, we're on a good track. Tell me more, is it gonna continue this way? If 10% of the project is done and 15% of the money has been spent, you say, whoa, I've got, that takes me down another road asking questions. So you combining the and you, you can ask those questions without being in attack mode on the people in charge. Okay, my experience with the people at the city government, 
uh, and elsewhere, uh, because I've gone to many meetings where you have staff presenting, okay, these are good people who want to do the right thing. Okay. As a, but, as a state employee, I appreciate you saying that because I agree. You know, it, 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 the, absolutely. I mean, very, very, you know, people for the most part don't go into the job and say, I want to do a lousy job. <laughs> right. Do job. Okay. And you know, I use the words management and leadership interchangeably. Uh, hmm. But I'll, I'll give an example of a time, and this is an approach to, in addition to those two questions I just asked, I brought up. When I was first elected on city council, uh, I was being introduced around to all the senior managers in, in the city uh, staff. And all of them are saying, congratulations, you know, Councillor Goodman, we're looking forward to helping you be a successful uh, counselor. Um, and I was always saying to him, I, my comment was, I said, great, thank you, I appreciate that. But just because I'm now sitting on the dais doesn't mean I know what I'm talking about. If I say something stupid, wrong, or incorrect, you've got to tell me. Oh, yes, Councillor Goodman, we'll let you know. Well, a few months goes by, something came up, one of the people was presenting, I asked a question where I was just, I was just wrong. I either had, I don't remember the specifics, but either my facts were wrong or the line of questioning was just way off base or whatever it was. And the person presenting uh, very gently, very professionally pointed out my error. And I responded by saying, oh, great. This is really helpful. Thank you. A few weeks goes by. I ran into that person uh, in the hall later and they, we were just chatting. Uh, and this person said to me, he said, Jeff, you passed because we get all the time people who said what you said, you know, if we're wrong, correct me. Then we get chewed out for doing it. <laughs> you didn't. You acknowledged your error. You thanked us for pointing it out. And then we went from there. Quote, we can work with you. Now, that's not, I don't mean that to be like, you know, uh, somebody saying, oh, we're not going to work with you otherwise, goes back. We have really good people working at all levels of government. But they also react like anybody else. If you hammer on them, they're going to want to clam up and keep what they talk about to a minimum. So that's a long way of coming back to my opening comment of saying, approach it with a certain degree of humility. And then when you do make a mistake, which you will, we all do, acknowledge it and don't blame the other person. Just take full ownership and say, I screwed up. Thanks for pointing it out. Well, before Alex closes, I will just say that uh, if you ever hear me saying something stupid, wrong, or a mistake, then I hope and expect that you will uh, correct me. <laughs> well, I, I can say uh, with 100% honesty in the times that we've gotten together, uh, breaking bread together, um, uh, I've enjoyed the conversations. And one of the things that uh, it doesn't mean we have to agree on everything, but you acknowledge nuance uh, within any policy position. And that, that's so important. I appreciate that. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. Great. Well, Jeff, thank you so much again for, for coming on the show. It was a real pleasure to have you. Uh, before we let you go, though, uh, where can people find you if they want to contact you or maybe they want to read some of your past work uh, or see uh, other different policy issues that you've talked about? Uh, where can they go to find you? You bet. Uh, I try and publish anything I write uh, on my website, which is, or I have somebody else who takes care of that for me. Uh, it's www.jeffgudman.org. That's jeffgudman.org. Um, I think my phone number's there. So if somebody has a question, feel free to give me a call or send me a text message or an email, carrier pigeon, <laughs> whatever. I, I do appreciate you giving out you gave out your phone number because uh, we had Mayor Snyder from Tiger. He was like, "Yeah, and you can call me, and my phone number is." And I was like, "Wow, he actually gave his phone number out live. That was crazy." Oh, and I think <laughs> I think Jeff knows Mayor Snyder too. <laughs> I, I, I think the world of, of of Mayor Snyder, Jason, and let me give you my number. It's 503-780-1524. We are we're like get we're, pulled off the air here for like some on the phone scam or something at some point. I was going to say the opposite. We are now the phone book <laughs> for politicos in Oregon to come on and uh, uh, get listed. So that's cool. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys for the service that you're doing. Uh, this was a really enjoyable conversation uh, and I look forward to the next one. All right. Yeah. We'll see you next All time. All right, everybody. Well, yeah. Thanks again for listening. Uh, please make sure to give us five stars. If you're 
platform does allow that and check us out on YouTube uh, for all the video content. Thanks again. I'll give you five stars. <laughs>